Good evening. You have crossed the threshold point. Behind you is the world you know, a world of sanity and certainty. Before you now is the vast, uncharted wilderness of the mind. In this blackened realm of hungry beasts and swirling specters, you will walk across floors of shattered glass and stumble into serrated edges. You will be vivisected by ferocious machines and probed by cybernetic inquisitors. Here is the brutal chaos of the imagination, the wondrous worlds and limitless prisons of the psyche. You are in here with us now. Welcome to Dark Therapy. Don't Feed the Trolls by Jordan Owen. Copyright 2012. Wake up, new brape, 1991, hissed the intercom in the corner of my room, though I'd already awakened to the dull click that resounded whenever the speaker was about to become active. I sat up on the thin, hard mattress and swung my legs over the side, moving compulsively. I no longer propelled myself through my morning routine with any personal thrust, not that I'd had much in the first place. For once I'd greeted the day, or late afternoon in my case, with a certain amount of energy and drive, I now moved only to escape the shocks that would blast through my collar if I hesitated too long. I swallowed hard as I rose to my feet, my Adam's apple shifting against the thick gray ring around my neck. Early on, a few of us had tried to brave the shocks in defiance of the speaker, but the shocks could be turned up strong enough to knock out a bear. Usually the shocks were just strong enough to stop us from doing whatever we attempted, but would increase as needed. Others of us had tried to push it all the way, suicide by shock, and attack our fellow inmates or try to pull the speaker's intercoms out of the wall or anything else that might provoke the caller or its unseen operator to send a lethal dose. But this was futile. We would inevitably pass out and wake up a short time later, only to be once more ordered by the speaker towards whatever action we'd been prescribed. I was completely detached now, having given in to the shocks to such a degree that my brain carried out the orders of the speaker reflexively and with no regard to my conscious choice. I simply sat atop the biomechanized transport station that was my body and watched out bloodshot eyes as the course of my day unfolded. I rose, crossed the plain white room and used the toilet, then stumbled listlessly down the hall towards the cafeteria. The room was oblong and, unlike the white tile of the rest of the facility, painted bright yellow. I took my assigned seat at one of the tables, not bothering to look across at Fucktalica A7X for life as I sat. His swollen, fatigued aura was only a mirror of my own. Poop Demon 91433 sat to my left, similarly silent. A few more inmates entered through the various doors and took their seats until all the chairs were filled. An intercom in the corner clicked to life. We have a new pupil in the facility, said the speaker, with a tone so dryly perky it could only be taken for sarcasm. Please stand up. A young boy who looked about age 11 stood up and glanced around the room nervously. His name is Brutal Truth. Say hello, Brutal Truth. The boy began to say, but my name is, and the rest of us looked away as he fell spastically to the floor, convulsing in his virginal exposure to the agony that the rest of us knew all too well. He was too new to know that the speaker would not be contradicted or corrected. It had sensed that moment of defiance, of trying to use one's given name, and had begun to teach the way the rest of us were taught. The lad would learn soon enough that birth names were not allowed. Your name is Brutal Truth, continued the speaker. Why else would you have used it on all of those websites if it weren't your name? The boy picked himself up off the floor when the shaking stopped and returned to his seat. I looked down the lines of inmates at the long rectangular tables and examined the boy. How much of his young life had he spent online to have crossed the unforgivable line already? None of us knew the exact number of victims necessary to cross the unforgivable line, but it had to be in the thousands. I returned my eyes to the table. Best to look at nothing. Brutal truth, look around you, said, spat the speaker. You are among the worthless, the swill, the scum, the lowest of bottom feeders of society. These putrid cretins are your fellow damned souls. 
Throughout history, it has been common to look upon certain human tragedies and declare that they are so awful that no human being deserves to be subjected to them. Those before you are those deserving. These are the revolting pigs that deserve to be gassed in the Holocaust. They deserve to have their bodies ravaged by cancer and AIDS. They deserve to be burned at the stake and impaled and crucified. They deserve to be thrown on bayonets in the Nanking. They are those who are deserving of every single shred of pain the human race has ever endured. And now you are among them. In time, you will realize that you deserve to be among them. These are your brothers in crime against humanity, brutal truth. These are your fellow trolls. The speech was similar to ones that we'd all received on our first day at the facility. I could still remember mine. The speaker had introduced me as the insipid fecal vomit of a thousand pedophile rapists. Poop Demon 91433 had been called the undisputed king of incestuous faggotry. The speaker came to delight in these creative insults, a joy that, like all joys, seemed distant and otherworldly, though not at all alien to the rest of us. After these proclamations, the feeding tube lowered from the ceiling and proceeded along its track, excreting large dollops of brown paste before each of us with a wheezing flatulence. When it finally got around to me, the tube gasped a few times and the sound of the buzzer was heard. Oh my! said the speaker with blatantly fake interest. Mr. Newbrape, 1991, it would seem that your food reserves have run out. You'll have to make more. I wanted to vomit, but the emptiness in my stomach and soul stopped me. The feeding tube continued down the rows, dispensing food from each inmate's personal reserve. It can't feed us like this forever muttered Fuck Talica, a 7X for life, as the feasting began. I mean, how many victims could each of us have had? I didn't respond and stared at the blank spot where my food would have been. The Room of Atonement is a circular room divided in half by a plate of glass. Into the glass is set a grated circular mouthpiece through which persons on either side of the room may speak to one another and a computer readout monitor which faces one side of the room. That side of the room features a single white chair with clasps on the arms which will close when the person is seated. The other side of the room features a semicircular bench attached to the wall and nothing more. The floor of the room is a dense grid of iron bars like a barbecue grill. The people who sit on the bench don't think about the floor or that pale, milky, crimson light that emanates up from it. They have never been in the Room of Atonement before and don't stop to think about the way the floor shifts a little when they step on it. I entered the Room of Atonement through the door behind the chair and sat. I'd only ever seen the room from this side and knew that this was, paradoxically, the side of lesser and greater evil. The clasps on the chair snapped shut around my wrists as a door panel slid open on the other side of the glass and a woman entered. She wore a blue sundress and her luminous blonde hair was tied back in a bun. Her feet were in sandals and I could see that she'd painted them with tiny psychedelic designs. Each of her big toes had little shooting stars on them and each pinky toe had a rising sun. Between them were miniature paintings of trees, ladybugs, and flowers. They were beautiful, as was she. This is Nellie McAllister, declared the speaker. I already knew who she was. Miss McAllister is a folk singer from the Atlanta area. After going massively in debt to afford to attend a prestigious music school, she attempted to launch a career in music by performing her songs at a local coffee shop and eventually set up her own website. Please read what you wrote on the forums of Miss McAllister's website. The screen before me flashed to life with a large block of text. In my hoarse, emaciated voice, I read aloud. Hey, I saw this ugly cunt at Java Lords. 
fuck this piece of shit and everything she tried to sing. Nellie McAllister will never provide the human race with even the slightest contribution of life. She simply lacks all skills in all aspects of life. Take, for example, her song, Born for Blue Skies, in which she crows tonelessly over the most pathetic acoustic guitar pseudo-strumming I've ever heard in my life, lol. This bitch needs to fucking kill herself with a shotgun up her centipede-filled twat. Miss McAllister deleted that comment from her forum and blocked you from further posting there, continued the speaker. Please read what you posted on the forums at the Atlanta Musical Hub website. Again, text. I tried to tell this bitch the fucking truth about her shit singing, and she fucking blocked me. Raid this bitch's site. Fuck, I will not be blocked on some emo cunt's half-assed shithole website. Fuck this bitch. After that, Miss McAllister sent you an email asking you to stop this behavior. Please read the subsequent email you sent to your friends. New text. Look what the fuck this cunt wrote me. Looks like she didn't get the fucking point, my friends. Let's let her fucking taste the real shit now. I went on in this vein. Every spam email I'd sent to Nellie McAllister, every harassing comment I'd posted to her site, even then, in that starved and terrified state, I was able to feel some kick of the adrenalized thrill that it had been to write those words. That blind, devious mania that became the ultimate social narcotic, bonding me to the primal id of my brain in such a way that I could feel all of my ability to express myself as a being of higher intelligence going down the drain into the primordial sewer of my bestial self. I read on. After months of flaming the folk singer, I'd started fucknellymcallister.wordpress.com, where I'd gone and ranted day and night about how much I hate, hated this woman. Finally, I got to the last post I'd ever made on that particular site. LOL, I heard that Nellie Tart is fucking pregnant. Well, I just hope it comes out looking like the shit-skinned, tree-swinging nigger monkey she's fucking behind her kike boyfriend's back. Fuck that shit. I hope the baby suffocates coming out. Then we can say it was black and blue. R-O-T-F-L-M-A-O. God damn, I just hope that nigger took his baseball bat prick out of that bitch's cunt long enough to fucking beat her over the head with it. God damn, if I was in charge of that woman, I'd fucking shit in her mouth every single goddamn day and tell her to swallow till she sang better. Here's hoping your baby dies a slow, painful death from leukemia, you pig-faced whale cunt. Finally, I was finished reading. Nellie looked across the room at me with solemn, though somehow seething, contempt. There was no amount of warmth in her withering glare. The moment hung in the air, both of us waiting to see what the speaker would say next, Nellie's white-hot eyes drawn needle-sharp as she stared me down. I looked down in a way, but could not avoid the ethereal feeling of her presence. I knew that if the barrier were not there, she would be tempted to lunge at me, but she was on the other side of the screen, which kept me safe from her reprisal. Now then, Miss McAllister, continued the speaker, Mr. Newbrate1991 is here because of his trolling of you and others. We asked you to come here because his food supplies have run out. Whenever this happens to one of our inmates, we allow one of the victims to decide if they wish to allow the inmate to continue being fed. Will you feed him or allow him to starve? Nellie McAllister looked at me again, this time examining the strain in my features. The speaker would not allow me to speak unless ordered, and so I sat in pained silence. I knew the routine. I knew what was to come. It was in the face of that foreknowledge that I now reeled. My eyes strained in terror, and I knew Miss McAllister was interpreting this as fear of my own death. This was not the case. My own death would have been preferable. In my quivering frown, she was perceiving remorse. In my tears, she was perceiving sorrow. She was, foolishly, missing the reality that my face was contorted only in anticipation of the moment ahead. Nellie McAllister looked down and closed her eyes. She was feeling the ultimate pull of empathy, that pang of commonality 
with those of her fellow species. It was right and good that she felt like that in life, but not now. Now was not the time for that. She was going to try to show me, like all those before her, that she was some kind of decent person unlike myself. How wrongly she perceived the intention of this moment. Don't let him starve, she whispered. I don't like him. I hate him. I hate everything about him, but don't let him starve. I won't stoop to his level. So you will feed him? asked the speaker. Yes, she replied, not stopping to think about the phrasing or the choice of words laid out before her. In the razor-sharp instant in which a mouse trap springs shut with savage efficiency, the bench on which Nellie McAllister sat was folded into the wall and the floor sprang open, dropping her into the bowels of the facility. Blades with a thousand teeth and the piston power to grind up bone sprang upon the aspiring folk singer, and I closed my eyes as a geyser of blood drenched the glass like hell's own car wash. After a few minutes, the work of those carnivorous machines ceased, and a malignant silence hung in the air. Miss McAllister's body provided enough food to fill you for three weeks and two days, announced the speaker. I returned to my room and sat down on the floor in the sunlight provided by the thin rectangular window across from the door. I couldn't see out, but there was a tree branch in my window, and from my time in scouts growing up, I knew that it was a Lawson Cypress, meaning the facility was probably located in the northwest. I had enjoyed scouts. Something about the rugged, albeit fairly safe, survivalism of it all spoke to me. It was as if my body, subjected to the endlessly flowing tapestry of nature, was compelled to find a place in the currents of the world, but that to find such a place was to be eternally transient, forever adapting to the flow of the waters of life, and that adaptation, that was what it meant to live. I did my best to think of nothing. It was a calming, friendly aura that would envelop me in those moments, and the discipline of maintaining that nothingness was the only vacant satisfaction I garnered from my life as it was. I'd lost track of time, but food usually lasted a month, give or take a few days, and I had been fed many, many victims. They had been my victims before my incarceration, and they were my victims now. It wasn't their fault that their kindness and better nature had been their undoing. It was mine. The long trail of thought that I'd walked down since my arrival here, the path which had led me to one redemptive step at a time to a state in which I could think about nothing, was the ongoing contemplation of how I'd ended up here. That process, in which I thought back over my adolescence, had been one of gradual realizations that I had slowly transferred my physical life, the life that swam hard in those streams of human action, over to a sort of surrogate existence in which my thoughts seemed to flow against the human current, antagonizing those that were able to swim faster than myself until I was little more than a piece of driftwood in their path. Those who had incarcerated me in the facility were nothing more than the groundskeepers who cleaned out the refuse that blocked the current's flow. The next day, Brutal Truth had his first meal. He'd been shocked into eating and vomited when he tried. As he ate his discharge up from the floor, I knew that he was having the same thoughts that all the rest of us had had at one time or another. That perhaps if he could not succumb to the shocks, perhaps he could simply endure them until he died of starvation, but no. Just as a single shock can cause the body to spasm in one way or another, so a series of tiny shocks can spasm the body to action, and the only way to still those minute agonies was to give oneself over to the speaker completely. Then, and only then, could one set out on the path that would lead to the stillness and salvation of voided, empty thought. Watching him, I remembered my arrival at the facility, the way in which my parents had called me upstairs from the basement to the kitchen where I was met by two agents from the facility who hooded and cuffed me in a sudden burst of action. Dad had been threatening to report me to the facility for months, ever since laws had been passed to allow for its operations. He, like so many, had unexpectedly fallen victim to trolls throughout his life and had been among the first to vote yes on the proposed legislation. 
I thought that even if he reported me, there was no way in hell I'd pass the unforgivable lie. Weeks passed and my food ran out again. Dutifully, I took my place on the chair in the Room of Atonement. My next meal entered and I recognized him immediately, Dwayne Smith. When his daughter had developed Hodgkin's lymphoma, he had created a blog to report on the progress of her treatment to all who were concerned. I had posted a comment on the blog saying that he was lying, that his daughter wasn't sick at all. When he took the comments down, I posted on other sites with the same sort of thing. It had been a thrill at the time seeing him get pissed off. The blog, which should have been devoted to his daughter's progress, became devoted to responses to me. When she'd finally passed away, I'd gloated all over the internet, writing glibly of the ways in which I longed to defile her corpse. I read each of my posts, each one more raving mad than the last. As I read, however, I took in Mr. Smith out of the corner of my eye, the way he entered the room and said in a square, formal manner, and, cl and his closely cropped hair suggested that he was a military man. As I reviewed my hateful writings, I reflected that at times I'd heard him refer to his years in the service. Making these mental notes, I probed for meaning. I scanned the short, uninteresting record of my own life for something to connect with. Perhaps there was something, anything, that would allow me to get a message across to Mr. Smith. In a burst of synaptic euphoria, it came to me. I finished reading and looked up to make eye contact with Mr. Smith as the speaker asked its inevitable question. Perhaps my time in Scouts would prove useful even now. I closed my eyes and opened them again, quickly, then for longer intervals, in a careful pattern. Please catch this, Mr. Smith. Dear God, catch this. My eyes open, close, sometimes blinking, sometimes holding shut longer. Short, long, long, short. Short, long. Short, short, short. Short, long. Short, 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 short. Please. Say no. They feed you to us. Tell others. I finished lo and looked, unblinking, into the eyes of Mr. Smith. They were still hard and focused, but they had narrowed out of raging hatred and into the slanted, contemplative posture of critical thinking. He stood up abruptly and said, No, let the little bastard starve. Are you sure? asked the speaker and I heard an unexpected note of surprise in his tone. Sure, I'm sure. Let him starve. And with these words, Mr. Smith blinked rapidly at me. Long, short, long, short, ten. Short, short, long, short. Short, long, 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 long. Short, short, long. Short, long, short. Four. The door slid open, and Mr. Smith exited quickly. My food did not come the next day, or the day after. What did you do? asked Demon Poop 91433 in a whisper. He knew that I'd found some way out. As the days wore on, other inmates' food ran out, never to be refilled no matter how many times they went to the Room of Atonement. I didn't know what was happening outside the facility. I didn't know what was going on, but somehow the word was being spread. Mr. Smith had made good on our brief exchange. I knew deep down that there was nothing but resentment in his heart, and letting me die out was not giving in to his better nature, but ignoring it completely. Still, it was the virtuous thing to do. And he was telling others. The whole world knew who was incarcerated here, and that their victims made regular visits. Someone had to be wondering about the disappearances. But surely the operators of the facility were wondering about that as well. They had to be. They had to have known that it couldn't go on forever. I wondered if they had a plan for what to do next. Days later, when the food paste had run dry for all of my fellow inmates and we teetered, sunken-cheeked and frail, on the precipice of life's finality, an inmate by the name of Testicle Mutilation Ponage was ordered to the Room of Atonement. He never returned, but we ate for several days. After that, we lost mutilated corpse fucka, and then Poop Demon 91433. It wouldn't be much longer. I did my best to think about nothing.